Okay, so let's go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. We're continuing our study in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, Revelation chapter 2. We're actually going to finish the chapter this tonight, so we'll be on to chapter number 3. So I think when we go slow and we take our time, we really see that Revelation has actually great importance to the church. It's really important to us, and we get lost in all of the visions and all of the debate concerning what's going to happen. But here we really see this, this picture of, of Christ judging the church and a call to action for the church. And when you just go slow and read the text, you really see that it's very applicable in our day. And I think, and I hope, I hope and I pray that we'll also see that ton uh, tonight as we look at the church of Thyatira. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith, and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing her servants to practice sexual immorality, and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw her into great tribulation unless they report, re repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the heart and mind. And I will give to each of you according to your works, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some called the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star." He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's a really powerful passage, pr probably one of the strongest um, that we've seen so far. And so let's go ahead and let's study the Word of God. Looking here at Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, I hope we're really seeing a pattern here and that the way... Um, well, let's, 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 let's look at verse 18 first, and then I'll make some concluding remarks concerning this. So from the previous weeks, we've already looked at three other churches. What should we expect here? What's the same? What's different? What are commands? Well, there's the consistent command of writing and, and also, yeah. um, you know, there's, there's a description of, of Jesus as well. I had to fix something here. So number one, you have this repetitive idea of a command to write, right, Luigi? And then what else? You, yes. you mentioned you mentioned a description of Jesus, correct? Right. I mean, it's 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 consistent throughout, but in this case, the description is different. It talks about his eyes being like the flame of fire, etc. Yeah. No, that's good. So let's just write here. The object of what's to write is the words of the Son of God. And, and this description is consistently um, Jesus, but they're uh, different descriptions, right? And so what I hope that you're seeing here is that Jesus is describing himself in different ways in order to call the church to action, does everyone see that? It's almost like their context drives the way that Jesus describes himself. You mentioned the description of Jesus. He is the one who has flames of fire and also whose feet are like burnished bronze. Jesus is, is describing himself, but it's not a generic description. His description is being driven by the church's context. So, for example, with the church of Smyrna, they're suffering the description is to the church is suffering. They're afraid of dying and, and, but they're faithful. And so Jesus description is don't worry. I'm the first and the last. I'm the one that's in control of life. 
And so he, so th the description is meant to encourage them. In this situation, the church is kind of, um, uh, well, for sure in Sardis, Thyatira, we're going to see this as well. Um, I'm sorry, not, not Sardis. Sorry, we haven't done Sardis yet. Pergamum, Pergamum. Last week was Pergamum. Um, th th there were some issues. And so the description was actually, it was a warning. Uh, he has a sword. He's going to fight against them. Um, and so what I, what I hope that we, we can see here is that the way Jesus is describing himself is to draw significance to the church's uh, context and also to what Jesus, is, what Jesus is going to command them to do, okay? What kind of description, how would you take this? Would you take this in a more negative or positive? And, and from our previous studies, how, how could we describe Jesus be, being here? Okay, so there's definitely, so the flame of fire and the feet of burnished bronze is describing Jesus's power. What does this symbolize? What, what do these things symbolize here? Jesus as judge. Jesus is being described as a judge here. And so it's, this is actually in a more negative warning context. It's actually scary because his eyes like a flame of fire. I mean, like a stare, you know, reminds me yeah. when, you're, when, you're, when your father is kind of mad at you and he will not, just, he will not speak, he'll just look at you, that stare, you know, makes you scared. So I have a couple passages here I want to read. The, the, if you, you can write these down as cross references to consider in your own time. So we have the, the first... All right, so the first passage is Psalm, Psalm 7, verse 9. Psalm 7, verse 9 says, Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to, a hand, come to an end, and may you establish the righteous who tests the minds and the hearts, O righteous God. And so we'll see this later in the context that the eyes pierce, the, the, the eyes of this flaming fire, you can't you can't hide from you can't hide from them, right? The eye sees everything. Is anyone Lord, a Lord of the Rings fan here? Is anyone a Lord of the Rings fan? Yeah, the eye of Sauron, right? It's always looking. It's always looking, right? Now that's of course in an evil context, but the the flame of fire is that this power, this seeing, all seeing type context. It's very it's very fearful. Let me read. Let me read another passage here, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. The end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. So there's this, there's this fear component. And I would say that's more in a reverence. Uh, it's, not, it's more than a reverence aspect. It's a fear as in God is an all-powerful judge. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing whether good or evil. So that's incredibly concerning. And so this is, that's the imagery we have here. And just really, really, uh, really quick, this is going to go to the, this is the object that's receiving the letter. So now we're looking at verse 19. What jumps out at you, verse 19? He gives them the good and the bad. Same as before, right? So Christ, yeah. is, Christ is really commending them for good things, but also calling them to account. And we have this, this knowledge statement here, right? Everyone's tracking with me there? This knowledge statement? He knows. His opening is similar to the one, uh, the, to the first letter in Ephesus. Yeah, no, that's really good. It's very similar in what they've, um, what their works are, right? It's almost the same. There's your, your love, your faith, your service, your patient endurance. And I, yeah, I see what you're saying. And that, and that this um, number five, that the, the later works are greater than the first. So there is this, there is this positive progression. So yeah, fair enough, uh, Silvio. Um, there is going to be a problem. Go ahead. What do you mean the latter works exceed the first? So latter, latter, we could say here later. No, but is that, are they, is he indicating that the, the patient endurance is better than the love? 
<laughs> I think that what it's saying, what they're saying is the works that they were doing at first. Got gotcha. so here. Yeah, it, 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 it's 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 gotcha. all of these works are pro progressing. They're growing. Yeah, you're you're doing a better job in love. You're doing a better job in faith and service. Yeah. Based on his last, his, his, maybe his last, uh, his last judgment. Yeah. When he, and he knows he's, he's present with them. He's the one walking amidst the, so he sees everything in real time. He's right there among, among his, 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 his lampstands and the lampstands of the church. So he's right there. He's seeing it on a daily basis. So this is a, this, this would be a, a positive, positive commendation. So basically they're increasing in faithfulness. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. But there's going to be a problem. And so this is this is something that we have to see here. We have to see this as Christians, we have to see this as leaders. We would we would never hold to a works-based we would never explicitly say that we hold to works-based salvation, meaning to say that our good works outweigh our bad and so if we have more good works the bad are, are dis are, are, are disregarded. Okay. We would never say that explicitly, but functionally, functionally, we fall into that trap. And what I mean by that is that we say we have all these good works here. And so because we have these good works, we overlook these bad things that we're tolerating, or we just like, okay, that's small. We're just ignore that. You see what I'm saying? Is everyone tracking there with me? It's almost it, it, in many ways, it's like, you know, I, I'm I'm 90% here, so I'm just not going to worry about the 10% or, or or that one small issue. I'm just not going to worry about that, okay? And and what what I I hope that we're seeing here is that that's not going to fly with Jesus. It's he's not demanding perfection, and what we see here, he's not asking for perfection, but he is asking for commitment, and they're not committed. They're not committed in all areas. So let's make a clarification. Jesus is not demanding perfection. There's never been a thing where he's looking and saying, you got to have a hundred or 200. He's looking at, so what I, what I want us to, I hope we can see here, he's looking at quality, quality, not quantity. And I'm going to show you why that's the case. Okay. So in some ways I'm setting you up here, but up until now, it has not been, uh, it has not been quantity. It has been quality, right? The church the church of Smyrna did not have as many works listed as the church of Thyatira, correct? Right now, there's four different works mentioned, and they're growing, okay? Look at what he has against them. How can I say this? This would be, this would be a correction here. Correction and warning. What is the warning here? What does Jesus have against them? Look at this, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, the content. Now, for those of you who know Old Testament, among other things, what did Jezebel do? If you're familiar. She tried to kill Elijah. Yeah, she tried, she tried to kill Elijah. Why, why did she tr why did she try to kill Elijah? He has his own prophets and there was a yeah. competition between Elijah and the and he, her prophets. Wh wh Elijah wh wh which prophets? Wh prophets to whom for her? Prophets to whom? Baal? Yeah, As Baal. In... She had she had uh prophets to ba Baal and she was causing Israel to worship Baal corporately this was not personal idolatry this was not personal idolatry this was not this was not even familial this was nationally and so um so this is this is the background context of the reference to jezebel historical context and and you could go to kings you could go to kings if you want to look at this later you can go to kings this would be in first Kings uh, 1631, also 2125, okay? 
but so this historical context is then informing the church now. So there was some woman in the church. Well, so so this is this we would say this is like a um, a metaphor. A simile uses like an as a metaphor is it just calls the person. I think there's actually a more technical name. It escapes me right now. A figure of speech in in, in, in literature. I can't remember what the word is, but it's literally just substituting. So th there there was some woman in the church, and they're just substituting her name for Jezebel. Okay, so it's not mentioning the woman by name. It's just referring to her as Jezebel. There, there's there's a there's a there's a name for that. I can't think of the word. It escapes me. I apologize for not preparing. Is it epithet? Yeah, so it's just a substituting one name for another. Is that, is, is that is that yeah okay? And then, let's let's go with that. And if and if it's incorrect, we'll we'll fix it later. But yeah, so so it's not, it's not allegory or something. It's not allegory because it's just replacing. It's it's substituting and it's literal. I mean, it's literal in the sense of Jezebel was a real person. She also symbolized something, and the person's engaged in the same behavior. So it's calling her her. If that makes sense. So it's like a substitution. Does that make sense? So then there's really a person that he's that that uh, it is referring to. Yeah, that that would be my interpretation. You know, I can I could give me a moment here. Let me see the different interpretations here, so we can I can tell you. So this would be just um, was there a real you know, was there a real per woman there? And so some commentators they say you know Jezebel is a daughter of Eth Baal, king of Sidon. She was the wife of Ahab. She tried to unite the worship of Baal in, in Baal in, in Israel. So not every commentary, but a lot of commentaries say that she, that one, they'll say one person was, I guess, literally named Jezebel, I think. And then there's other people that will say that, no, it's just a real person that is being called Jezebel. And I think that's the most reasonable. I don't think there was probably a woman I could be misreading that. That's what it seems to say. I, I don't think it's a literal woman Jezebel in the church. I think it's figuratively. There was someone there that was engaged. They don't, met, but they're just saying she's 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 acting like Jezebel. So they just call her Jezebel. Okay, real person in the in the church. But Jezebel can be used for multiple women, right? That woman. Well, it would because it's singular. I would say it's probably one. And you had in the churches prophetess, you know, you had, you, you, the church has always had that issue of, uh, you know, early on, you know, women, women in leadership in the church for someone who says that there isn't because Paul addresses that and there's debate. I don't want to get into that debate tonight, but she was in leadership in the church at this time. It seems to be at least one woman. I think it's probably because it's, it's singular, it's singular here, it's singular here, singular here. I think it's probably one woman that's in leadership that's that's teaching this, and they're just accept they're 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 tolerating it. They're not confronting a, a false teacher and a, and false teaching. Even here, it's singular, singular. So I do think it's it's one it's one leader in the church that is practicing false teaching. Okay, so then she would be by implication a false teacher. And, and this, the, the things that she's teaching is in, so background here to, 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 Th to Thyatira. Thyatira is a prominent city in, 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 in government in this region in Asia Minor. It has been for centuries. It rose to province under Alexander, Alexander the Great. It's in, it's in a strategic location for, for being a, a city that controls the region. And so that's kind of why it rose to prominence. Its, its physical location was advantageous. And so here, within the city, this is where the emperor worship really began in, in the region. And so you had tons of idolatry, and it wasn't just in the rel religious sphere. So they had a lot of trade guilds in this city, and the trade guilds participated in idolatry to get economic success, okay? So, it's, it's, so there was probably an economic advantage to the teaching of sexual immorality and food sacrifice to idols. And this was the practice of these trade guilds idolatry. Okay. So they're, you know, they, they have these cult prostitutes, maybe it's, it's in relationship to blessing. They're engaged in sexual immorality um, to get blessing from the gods. 
they're also eating food that's being sacrificed. So, so they're participating, they're syncretistic. They're participating in the, the idolatry, the idolatry worship. And we talked about that last week. Pastor, Pastor brought up a, a good distinction there compared to 1 Corinthians. This is like a public participation. Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? So in, in the church in Sarah, there is really this one woman who's identified as Jezebel or maybe a representation of Jezebel in the Old Testament yeah. as really committing this, uh, this sin. And she, is, she, she was kind of fooling some people in the church. Is that what's happening yeah. here? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a very fair summary, you know. And you even have this reference here. I, I really don't think I don't know if maybe Je Jezebel calls herself a prophetess in the Old Testament, but for sure she's calling herself a prophetess here. Uh, that that's a fair summary. So I guess when Jesus is saying, "I have this against you," is that something that that's the entire church, right? Yes, and and the key here is that look at this. So. Just to be clear, so we talked about the woman is singular. It's all singulars. So let me just, I wanna, I wanna confirm this here. The, the you is, okay, so the you is also, is also singular. The, the, the you is also singular, but it's because, okay, yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, so the, the church is also singular. So, so, so um, the you here is singular. And, and up here, the church is also singular. So that's, so, so the you is not referring to, to her. It's referring to the church as a, as a corporate unit. What he has against the church is that they're falling for this woman in, who indicates that she's a prophetess. Yeah, it's, it's so essentially, if we read this correctly, one of the things the church is to do based upon Paul's teaching and others, even Peter, is to, is to maintain church purity, not just morally, but also doctrinally in teaching. We see this also in, in, in the letters of John. They're to, remove, they're to remove false, they're not even to have fellowship with false teachers. They're, they're to remove them. They're not even to wish them Godspeed in, in John's second gospel. So here, they're, they're allowing a, a false teacher to be in leadership, and they're not holding the teacher to account. So in this situation, so like in Ephesus church, Ephesus church, right? They caught the false apostles. They showed them what they were. They did not allow them, but they left the first love. Here they have love. Here they have faith, but they're not, they're, they're tolerating false doctrine. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Does everyone see? So so each church has different issues, and Jesus' teaching is to really address their context. And the benefit for us, for us to see here, is that each church has a different issue. So we can't assess ourselves as a church. We should not be comparing ourselves to other churches, but to God's standard. So, so this is this is very practical here. There are different, there, there are, there are. There are churches around, you know, and this is like maybe on, on a scale of, on a scale of following Christ's commands. There, there is, you know, there's, there's different levels here. You know, some churches have more commendation, others have less, but what the churches cannot do is they can't compare themselves with each other to say, oh, see, I'm, I'm further ahead. I'm good to go. Do you see what I'm saying? This is a, this is wrong. What, what the churches should be doing is they should be comparing themselves to the teaching and command of their Lord. So the comparisons are here. And it's not one of quantity, it's one of quality. All their works should be, whatever works they do, whatever God has given them and called them to do, they should be pure and holy. And you really see that because with the church of Smyrna, let's go back to the church of Smyrna. The church of Smyrna 
look at their works. They have tribulation, they have poverty, but they are rich. That's it. <laughs> There's nothing else. It doesn't re refer to their great works of endurance. Now, for sure, they have endurance. It's not re referring to all their great faith, to their love. It, it's just it, nothing like that. Now, now, I'm not saying they didn't have that, but it's not of, of significance to G Jesus is looking for quality. He's looking for quality over quantity. And so he's, he is going to be honest with what they've done. They, they've done these, they've had, they've had these great works. Love, faith, service, patient endurance. Their latter works exceed their first, right? So Jesus is going to be honest. It, 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 it does matter to Jesus. We are going to be judged according to our works. But Jesus is, is interested fundamentally in quality. And so this must be the pattern. We can never look at ourselves and our, compare ourselves to, to those around us and say, oh, we're better than them. I'm okay. Is everyone tracking there with me? God wa Jesus wants 100% commitment. He, he doesn't want 90% and, oh, I got this 10% here. I got this 10% here of lack of self-control and discipline. Anyway, Jesus has 90%, so it's okay. No, he wants 100% commitment. Moving on here, um, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent. So Jesus is patient. I noticed that uh, when, when you said, I know your love, your endurance, right? And then he said, but I had this against you. Compared to the church in, in uh, Pergamum in, in, in Ephesus, when, when, when he said, I had this against you, and they said, I will come to you. He was referring to the church. If you don't yeah. repent, I will come to you. But here, he didn't say it, but it's only per the, the punishment seems to be pertaining only to the woman. Yeah, no, that's really, that's interesting. That's interesting. Even the Lord says, I, had, I have this against you. You're tolerating this woman, Jezebel. He didn't say, I will come to you. But he, the, 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 the concentration of the punishment is on the woman, not yeah. to the church. No, that's really that's really interesting, and that's really good. And and it does seem to be that the focus is more on her and and those who participate, those who participate as well. So then Jesus's response here is Jesus's response is going to be um, judgment. So yeah, so so there's going to be a throwing her on a. A sick bed. It's it's her, and then also those who participate. The sphere, the sphere here is great. Is is judgment. This is judgment here. But notice, there's still a chance, right? There's still a chance here. But he does refer to her works here, even though he's saying they're committing adultery with her. That he's still referring to her works. Unless yeah, they so, repent of her works. Yeah. yeah, so so well that would be distinguishing her works from Christ's works, right? The work that got Christ commands the church and the work that she's telling them to participate in. So I do think that there is this there is this incentive to really participate in this. This is more a mirror read, okay, because we're looking at what there he's saying, and then we're we're looking at the situation and we're reading back into the situation what's going on. I think there is this. She's saying, you know, probably most of the time when someone tries to get someone to participate in sin, they have to justify it. So she's probably justifying it and saying, listen, we can reach the trade guilds if we participate in their, in their, in their worship. We, we can even bring them to Christ, you know, but we have to participate. And so she's really encouraging them. Again, I, this is my interpretation. This is my, I'm, I'm imagining this is not gospel. This is not the word of God. I'm, I'm, I'm adding, I'm filling in some context, but you can imagine that she's trying to probably out of good intentions, the, the, the road to destruction is paved with good intentions, <laughs> right? The ends, the ends justify the means, right? Yes, yes. And so her works are participating in idolatry. Those would be her work. And she's so... Because she's a leader, she's calling those followers to engage in this. So that's why, 
And this is to be distinguished with works of Christ. So, so I would really, I would really emphasize that. And that's a great observation, Silvio, that there is this, it does, this, this really speaks to leadership as well, that are we, are we actually teaching what Christ calls us to do in the practice? Who's participating should realize that it is idolatry. Yes. And, and look, look at this. This is really, this is really, this is really serious here. So the judgment, the judgment leads, the, 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 the judgment will lead to death. Yeah. Are those, are those literally her children? So if you're picking up on the metaphor with Jezebel, so, so, so Jezebel is not literal, right? It's representing a woman. Her children would also probably be, um, this is not. So this is probably also figurative, if that's making sense. There's a literal maybe, woman there that's sig being signified. Go ahead. Maybe it's referring to those who are following her. Exactly. All no, that's exactly. Excellent. Yes, yes. So then this is the, the her followers. Yes, act, absolutely. Yeah, excellent. That I agree 100%. Yeah, de de dead on. I, I think that's that's really fair and accurate. A and look at the conclusion. So this is so this is the judgment. So this here is the this here is the 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 judgment of the Lord. And look at the purpose of this. Look at the look at the purpose, or the, we could say maybe the goal. Look at this. All the churches will know. So Jesus knows certain things. All the churches will know what? What's the content of the knowing? That I am he who searches the mind and heart. So this is a reference to God Almighty as judge, as this is a big word, eschatological judge, eschatological judge. We have physical judges here. Christ is, is being revealed here as the eschatological judge, and, and his judgment and assessment is coming first upon his house before he judges the world. Think about that for a second. Uh, Peter says this. Let me read Peter here. Okay, look at this. Peter says this, beloved, do, 1 Peter 4.12, beloved, do not be surprised at the fear, fiery judge trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also be share, rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, what shall be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? This is something that we don't really think about, um, that, that God does judge his house. And th this is part of standard Orthodox teaching. That does not mean that we can lose our salvation it does mean that he is going to test his house to see who is truly his followers and who are not. And he's going to assess our works and his judgment begins with us and it ends with the world. Okay. And so here we have the same thing. Christ's judgment begins with his church, an amazing pattern. It begins with his church and then it's going to climax in the rest of revelation with the world. Does everyone see that here? That that's actually a very profound truth. You should you should write down. Yeah. Isn't that uh, Paul mentioned that in the Corinthians that all the works will be tested by fire, and those yeah. those who are gold will be pure, and some are hay and get burned. Yeah. You know, you're still no. saved. You're still saved, but but your works aren't really pure. That's why you don't get a reward. <laughs> yeah. So no, that's really good. First Corinthians three. Uh, 2 Corinthians, I believe, 4 to 5, that we must all before appear before the judgment seat of Christ to see what to, to see what was done in our body, good or bad. You have the, the judgment in 1 Corinthians 3. So this is the crazy thing. What Pastor Noel is saying is correct. You know, the judge, the, the, the works will be burned up, but we'll be saved yet so as through fire. But there is a level where the works are so bad, it really reveals the one who destroys God's temple, God's body. Christ will destroy him. 
So in Corinthians 3, there is both a warning of, of you can suffer loss, but you will be saved. But then there is this, there are some that are actually destroying the church of God, and they're, they're actually false teachers, and they, God will destroy them eschatologically. When, I, when I'm saying eschatologically, maybe you haven't heard that term before, that's a reference to uh, the end time eternal damnation, eternal judgment, okay? It's not just a judgment here and now. It's the final judgment. Eschata, es, es, eschaton, eschaton, eschatos is last. And, and here we have, we, we, should be, we should be done. We're getting close to being done. Here we have a, a reference to, I will give each of you according to your works. So there is still this, this judgment of the church. But pastor is correct. It doesn't, we're all going to be judged. We, we, will, we could all suffer loss, but that doesn't mean that we're losing our salvation. And then there will be some within the church that are not truly believers. And it's not that they'll lose salvation. They will be judged and deemed uh, an unbeliever and, and, and removed from the church, okay? We, what we should not conclude here is this is not teaching a, this is not teaching a, this is not teaching a works-based salvation or a loss of salvation. And, and we, we can know that for sure because, because in Revelation 1.5, he has uh, cleansed us with his blood. Revelation 1.5. To him who loved us, loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. Okay? So... So it, it's a, it's an, uh, if you're reading that literally and you're reading this literally, we have to reconcile the two. We would not put this against the other, okay? You, we're no longer reading in context. And so in this context here is that within the church, there are those that are truly believers and truly unbelievers. And there are those that will suffer loss. They will be judged, but they will not be condemned eternally. They will just suffer loss in, in the final judgment of their works. Is everyone tracking there with me? You can reference the that verse 23 to Jeremiah 17 10. Jeremiah yep. 17 10 it says, I the Lord search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Yes, excellent. I like that. That is really good. That is really good. I like that a lot. Because that's also in the background. It's saying that Jesus is also the Lord. <laughs> really good reference. Thank you, Pastor. That's an excellent reference. Jeremiah 17, 10. Now, I will say this. I will say this. It does seem in this context, I, I, I do want to, I want to highlight something here. It does seem to be that looking here, it, this does seem to be something maybe demonic within the church. And God has allowed it to remain. And I think this also picks up with what Pastor Noel is saying, that the church, those in the church, because she is also in leadership. She is also in leadership here. So there is something to be said, possibly, that, that this is something, this is something uh, demonic and, and maybe cannot be removed from the church at this time. And so the call to those, to those in, th in the church is to is to just hold fast is to hold fast to what you have until i come does everyone see that here so it, it, there, there does seem to be something moving we know that we know that the lord permits from the parable of the wheat and the tares is everyone familiar with the parable of the wheat and the tares okay so i'll just really highlight quickly the parable of the wheat and the tares is found in is found if it's found in Matthew. Uh, I would just read Matthew 13 because there's several parables there. The, the, the parable of the wheat and the tares is highlighted. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, the, 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 the big story is that God has, has planted in his field wheat, and then the enemy who is Satan comes in the middle of the night, his enemy, and he plants all these tares. And then the angels, the servants say, let's go remove the tares. And the Lord of the house says, no, because if you remove the tares, you're going to destroy the wheat. Let both grow together until the end of the age, and then I'm going to separate. 
And so there is something to be said in some churches. There is a, the, the Satan has planted these, this, this corrupt tares. They're, they are not, they are weeds. They are not wheat. And that doesn't mean the church should not be purifying itself. It does not mean the church should not be holding um, uh, church leaders in, a, in authority. But there are certain contexts where there is corrupt leaders in the church and those at the lower level, those, those members have no choice, okay? There is a context for that in our, in our church era, in, in this new covenant community. And so here, I think we see that clearly, this call of, of holding fast and not participating in that corrupt behavior in the church. And I think that what pastor was bringing up, that it's different than the church in, in Pergamum, I think that's a, a very good uh, observation. And I think that's the case here, that perhaps Jezebel, she could be the leader of the church, you know, she, she could be. She could have such power in the church. There's nothing that can be done. We just don't know enough to be to speak definitively. But it does seem here that the command is for those righteous people in the church. The command is just to hold fast and remain faithful. And then we have this promise here. We have this promise here. Look at what the promise is. The promise is referencing to leadership. So perhaps this is even a stronger reference to the corruption in the church. Here you have a reference to leadership over the nations. So this is, you, you'll receive authority. You will rule. And I will give him the morning star. This is most likely a reference to who's the morning star? Jesus. Jesus. This is, this is a reference to the presence of Jesus as Lord. And here we have a comparison. So the promise here, look at the different promises. We have promise of, of hidden manna. We have a promise of a, a new name. Uh, we have, so, so let's write down some of these promises from earlier. What we should not do is we should not think that each promise is unique but that all of the promises apply to all those who are true believers, okay? So in, in, in the church of Ephesus, we have the promise of, yeah, the, the fruit of the tree of life. And so this is a reference to eternal life. To the church in Smyrna, we have the reward of life and protection from eschatological death. And then in Pergamum, we have the, the hidden manna, right? The hidden manna and, and the new name. And then, and so this is, this is, this is also maybe referencing life. And this is a, uh, this is presence and relationship, right? So he knows our name. He names us. There's an intimate relationship. And then number four, now we have this promise of ruling, and authority. Everyone tracking there with me? So this is powerful. And, and, and this, this quotation here, this is quoting Psalm, Psalm 2, which is applied to Christ. So is this, is this, this is crazy because now this is being applied to the church. Does everyone see that? Let me read Psalm 2. Let me read Psalm 2 so that everyone can really track with, I'll bring it up here on the screen. I want us to really see this and to contemplate this. So Psalms 2, I'm just going to read it and you can just follow along. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart. Let us cast their cords from us. So this is the nations rising up against the Lord's uh, kingdom, his sovereignty, his reign. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. So now this is the Lord's anointed speaking. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. 
Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So that is referring to the Messiah, literally quoting, and then here it's applying to the church. Does everyone see that? Does everyone see the potential issue there? Psalm 2 is, is applying directly to, to the Christ. But then here, Christ is applying it to the church. Why is this possible? What theological truth? We're going to bring in some other theological teaching. Why is this not heresy? Why is this not contradictory? Why is this amazing? What is the key concept in New Testament theology that really allows this to be true? Can anyone think Christ is the head and finish it for me? Christ is the head and church is the body. Church is the body. So this is one. This is one, right? So looking at this, absolutely this is not contradictory. If 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 the church is one with Christ, we are in union with Christ. And we are his hands and feet. We are his body. Christ is still the head. Christ still rules through us. But yet we also carry out the work of the Lord. Does everyone see that? And so this union with Christ brings into purview how it is that Christ is the one that's going to dash them in pieces. He is the one that's going to rule. And yet so is the church. <laughs> is everyone tracking there with me? Does everyone see this power, this powerful picture here? Is that making sense? So this is actually, this is so profound. This should be so profound and just amazing that Christ shares his kingdom with us. He shares his throne with us. That's why we call co-heirs with Christ, right? Mm. Yes. So we have the reference to co-heirs. If we will suffer with him, we will reign, right? Reference to, to reigning. If you suffer, you will reign. We are co-heirs. He is the firstborn of many brothers. So when we're going through hard times, when we're tempted to compromise our faith, when we're tempted to compromise, how can this apply in our day? How can we be tempted in our day? Think about our own day. How can we be tempted? How can we, how can this be applied to us in our day? And any thoughts or comments? Uh, I'll start us out. Um, all entertainment is okay. So every, every form of entertainment, every form of, of media is okay. And in reality, there is some very unhealthy, idolatrous, and immorality in media, whether it's movies, whether it's social media, whether it's, whether it's other forms, whether it's Netflix, right? So there's always that, for, for us, it's, you know, oh, it's not a big deal, right? And so we actually participate in sexual immorality. We allow it to become idolatrous. It, it, it takes the place of God. We... We spend all our time, we would never say this, you know, no, no, God, God is our God, but our time, our time, we're down worshiping, worshiping the media that's being placed before us. And, and the proof of the pudding is in the, is in the time, is in our time commitment. Yeah, we can be in swats, like yes. one season or five seasons of shows, and yet you don't, you don't be in swats the Bible kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's true. And you feel sick after, right? You feel sick. You feel sick sometimes. We can allow social media and political discussion to become idolatrous, right? No one's exempt from this. We can allow that to consume all our time and it actually makes us sick as well. So let's think about that. I'm, I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to turn it over to, to pastor. Now, let's think about how, you know, in your own devotions, in your own quiet time, Think about how we fall into traps of allowing, of allowing false teaching to creep in. Social media, media, they're, they're, they're teachers, whether we recognize it or not. And we allow them to, be, to influence the church. We allow them to influence our thinking. And what are the Jezebels of our day? What are the Jezebels of our day? And for each one of us, it could be something different. Secularism in academia, it could be, it could be, you know, being scientific. It could be media. There are a lot of different things. Politics. It could be economic. Go ahead. Politics. Politics, yes. 
So what I don't want us to think about is, oh, I don't engage in sexual immorality. I'm not committing idol worship in this literal sense. So it doesn't apply to me. No, th th that <laughs> I want us to be thinking about what are, what, what are some idols in our own lives that we've allowed to become idols? And I don't, I don't want to hear, no, we don't worship. We don't worship really God's my, my, God's my, what I worship. I want you to look at your time. I want to look at your affections. I want, look at, I want you to look at your affections and I want you to look at your time. And, and looking at your affections and desires and your time will tell you where your idols are. It could even be family. So I, I want you to be thinking about that. And maybe some of us need to get with our accountability partners and to confess some sin. Not now. I want us just to be, as we read through Revelation, to be, to be considering this and to, and to be considering how we can draw, how we can do the works of Christ, not the works of the world.